Good evening. Thanks for coming tonight. I'm Sarah Mowry. I'm the Outreach Director for the Deschutes Land Trust. Thanks for joining us, and welcome to our first installment of our 2020 Nature Night series. Woo. We're looking forward to this season's presenters and the rich topics they will cover. Our second Nature Night is on February 26th, and it filled in 48 hours, I'm sorry to say, but add yourself to the wait list. <laughs> our third Nature Night is on March 31st, and it's all about microplastics. Uh, so I recommend putting February 28th on your calendar, which is the day it will open for registration. Should be a great talk. The Land Trust is proud to present this annual Nature Night series. Um, we bring these experts in the field of natural resources to you so that they can share their knowledge and stories and we can all learn more about the nature of Central Oregon. Why do we do this? So that collectively we can take better care of the nature of Central Oregon into the future. One way you can do this is by getting involved with your local land trust, the Deschutes Land Trust. This year the land trust celebrates 25 years. <laughs> We've been conserving and caring for land in Central Oregon for that long and we'd love to have you get involved. Here's how. You can, of course, volunteer your time inside and out. You can share our work with your neighbors and friends. Next time, bring someone to Nature Night who doesn't know about the Land Trust, or come on one of our walks and hikes. And of course, you can donate to the Land Trust. Any amount helps conserve and care for land in Central Oregon. Regardless of how you get involved, I hope you do get involved. Together, we can make our community a better place for humans and wild. And now, without further ado, in preparation for our speaker, please silence your cell phones. It's also very helpful if you don't use it during the presentation, if you don't need to, because the light is hard on your neighbors. Tonight's speaker will be taking questions at the end of the evening, and if you shared your email with us, we will follow up with a link to her presentation and other resources in coming days. Elizabeth Woody is the executive director of the museum at Warm Springs. She's an enrolled member of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs and is also Navajo, Warm Springs, Wasco, and Yakima. She served a two-year term as Oregon's Poet Laureate from 2016 to 2018. Woohoo! She's a published author and a fine artist, an amazing fine artist. Elizabeth received the American Book Award, William Stafford Memorial Award for Poetry, and was a finalist in the Poetry for Oregon Book Awards in 1994. She's an alumna of the first Kellogg Foundation's fellowship through the AIO Ambassadors Program. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to introduce Elizabeth Woody. I'm going to uh, try to be as seamless as possible in the essay portion of this presentation. I, um, you know, there's a lot of information that I had to research and get source materials on and whatnot for my poetry, for essays, for short stories. Um, I was asked to write an essay for on um, water as utili uh, water as it, utilitarian usages of water by the tribes. And this was for the U.S. Forestry Service, and you can find it online. But one of the, uh, that was an exhaustive research I had to do. But I also interviewed several of our elders and persons who were uh, very involved in, you know, in the fishing management of our fisheries, and also uh, co-managing the river systems. The person who edited that anthology told me that she just, you know, burst into tears when she was reading my essay. She said, "Finally, something I could read and feel something really strongly about," <laughs> and that's kind of the way I, I try to write. But this is going to be a little bit dry because it deals with some history, deals with some facts, just a baseline so that when we get into the portion of just where I stand as a citizen of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, where I stand as a descendant of the first peoples of the land and also how I feel about um, my U.S. citizenship and the, our place in the world. So the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs is a 640,000 plus acre of land, and it belongs to three tribes, the Warm Springs, the Wasco, and the Paiute people. So the tribes are made up of the Upper Deschutes, Tai, Lower Deschutes, Wyam, Tanino and John Day, Docks, Pus, Bands, and the Wasco tribe is comprised of the Dalles and Dog River Bands, and several Southeastern Oregon Paiute Bands joined the reservation, came to the reservation in 1869 as prisoners of war. 
Um, <clears throat> today, the enrolled membership of the all three tribes totals over 5,000 with 3,000 plus members who reside on the reservation. And this can change from time to time, but once we get the census done, we'll have more accurate information. Many people don't know that it's governed by a council of 11 people. There are three chiefs who serve lifetime appointments and three representatives are elected from three different districts on the reservation. There's the agency, there's some Nasho, and there's the Xiqua. And it kind of shows the breakdown of the three groups that I just mentioned, with agency being mostly Wasco, Simnasho being Warm Springs, and uh, Siksikwa being primarily Paiute people. Um, these, uh, the, but anyway, the Warm Springs Tribal Council and the Warm Springs Tribe as a whole co-manages the Columbia River, the Chutes River, 15 Mile Creek, John Day, and Hood River watersheds. And we also have a U.S. Fish and Wildlife hatchery on our, our reservation. So <clears throat> most of you are familiar with the Cascade Mountain Range. Mount Jefferson is kind of like the boundary, uh, most west boundary of our reservation. And the Deschutes River comprises the eastern part of the reservation on up to, um, I, I don't know, almost the 45th parallel. I'm not sure how that works. The... Uh, People in Warm Springs still exercise our treaty rights. For example, you can go to Shears Bridge. It's a really nice road trip. I don't think people are fishing there right now, but they have scaffolds there where, where our fishers go and fish on the, off the bridges. So this 640,000 acres is just a small portion of the 10 million acres we ceded in the Treaty of 1855. And prior to the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, which was um, passed by Congress, uh, required all existing tribes to, to uh, formulate, um, formula, not provide a formula, but formalize their government system. And the Warm Springs and Wasco people prior to that and after that still li live by what we call the unwritten laws. And the examples of these um, laws and the respective nations, these are long-lived creeds and ceremonial codes, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. So the examples of Teachum show the memory, the long memory of the land includes the understanding from the creator to the people, this land is for you. As I heard, I will tell this to my children. Iwa Chennai means this is the past, the present, and the future. It always was and always will be. You must follow the teachings of the land, which is to not, or to follow, not necessarily the land, but just to follow. And this is the word that is above the museum's door. And what I'm going to tell you is, is going to show how deep our responsibility is that we will never abrogate or leave our responsibility to care for this culture, the land, and the natural resources. In 1855, actions um, and in continual practices of the Warm Springs people have been reinforced and ensure co-management of the fisheries, forests, high desert, and waters within the ceded lands, not the 644,000, but this 10 million acres so, and the Confederated Tribes are senior, a senior government of the land. Uh, 1855, if you go by the treaty, precedes the foundation of the state of Oregon. So, um, we constantly remind the state of Oregon that we're their older brother or sister. <laughs> and we are major partners with other governments and entities who impact the environment and education. <coughs> Excuse me. In the Treaty of 1855, there were several that we were part of the Middle Columbia River, but there was also the Umatilla tribes, and this quote is from Young Chief at their treaty council, and explains how the earth provided all the food. I wonder if the ground has anything to say. I wonder if the ground is listening to what is said. I wonder if the ground would come alive and what is on it, though I hear what the ground says. The ground says it is the great spirit that placed me here. The great spirit tells me to take care of the Indians, to feed them all right. 
The great spirit appointed the roots to feed the Indians on. The water says the same thing. The great spirit directs me, feed the Indians well. The ground, water, and grass say, the great spirit has given us our names. We have these names and hold these names. The ground says, the great spirit has placed me here to reduce all that grows on me, trees and fruit. The same way the ground says, it was from, the, from me man was made. The great spirit and placing men on the earth desire them to take good care of the ground and to do each other no harm. So as a member of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, that in, in, in a sense encapsulates the responsibility that we uphold and understand before and after the Treaty of 1855. Nami Anitla or Nami Piup, which is the creator, older brother, is representative of the Columbia River Plateau's maker or elder brother, and they placed us here. Sorry, that sounds redundant. But at the time of the creation, the creator placed us in this land and he gave us the voice of this land and that is our law. Teach him again is the Warm Springs word that refers to the ancient activity on the land and is of the land. This land is for you to know and live upon and pass on to the children. It is more than a memory, native language, or human history. The knowledge embodied by land holds cyclic actions for the Columbia River human history for the Plateau people as life patterns. In spring, for example, the Warm Springs tribes welcomes their little relatives return after winter, the salmon. We honor the food chiefs and essentially the water, salmon, deer, edible roots, and water. So we have ceremony from the beginning to the end of one's life. There are the makings of our hands and creative will to recall our relationships with plant, animal life, and mineral. This mastery of knowledge given hand to hand also provides artistic history collected in the museum at Warm Springs. This museum holds the largest tribally owned collection of contemporary art and historical artifacts of in the nation. And Warm Springs Chief He said, this is our documentation of who we are and shows our presence here from the beginning of time. It shows how we use the materials without harm to the land. Our history is in these things. Our ancestors are represented there. So gathering these traditional materials for things such as baskets and mats, and it happens on the reservation and off the reservation. Tribal natural resources programs as well as personal tribal members must educate off-reservation entities that are private and public, such as Bureau of Land Management, Bureau of Reclamation, Grasslands, and various national forests on treaty and sovereignty of the tribes. These relationships help with the growth for traditional plant enhancement and gathering besides the food gathering. And I'd like to kind of add in here that many people think of the Americas as virgin lands, meaning they were untouched, but they were clearly managed by the people who lived here. It's how the plains were formed. It's how the oak uh, bottom of the Willamette Valley was formed. Uh, I think that I could go further on, but each region had management by the people who lived there. <coughs> so um, we actually, manage and honor these four sacred food types. And they are the salmon, waikanish, again, deer, wenat, roots, khnit, berries, tmanit, and always start and end our ceremonial meals and day with water, which is chush. Think of these foods not as just foods, but there are medicines, and water is our highest and first medicine. So these codes or these life ways you can see them in Sundays in the Longhouse when we have worship songs and dance, which is washat well, taikish. And while religious practices were not guaranteed native peoples until the Native American Religious Freedom Act of 1979, the Columbia River Plateau people practiced from a time beyond memory to the present. And our usage of the water begins at this nascent time of human order and society. So we never left our responsibility to care. 
and we pray for all life and health of the lands, waters, and air. And people call this a subsistence culture, which makes us seem like we were barely making it. But through this traditional wisdom and technology, I, I emphasize technology, we demonstrate through a systemic, deeply codified life way, our wealth and wholly bonded with the rivers we lived upon. So there are approximately were 100 tribes in Oregon that we define as Oregon, and all of them had salmon as their foundation for their culture, economy, and religion. And you know what I'm going to show a little bit is about the salmon feast is a vital part. So our food stores were incredible. Um, Clark observed passing the Celilo Falls, 107 baskets containing about 10,000 pounds of dried salmon. And there's all kinds of estimates about how many salmon came up the river and how much salmon was, was captured by the tribes. And it's always said that the tribes just weren't big enough to off all the salmon. So, <laughs> but the <laughs> truth was they were conscious of how much to take. And every, every time the runs would come, for example, the, the salmon chiefs who were guarding the salmon would close the fisheries for a period of time so this fish could go up to the Snake River and to that creek. They knew that these fish in June had to go up to British Columbia and they close it then. So there was a management and a kind of an honorary system. So they weren't catching all the salmon at the mouth of the river, which happened when uh, commercial fisheries came. That's pretty much in the 1800s did in the salmon along with the canneries and the dams. So I'm gonna go to the other side of our history. Conquest and discovery allowed many European nations to occupy lands, particularly of the Americas. This had drastic impact and of course there's a lot of books on that. I don't need to go follow on that, go on that. But still, the colonizers had to follow laws. For the US, there is the 1787 Northwest Ordinance, which says the utmost good faith shall always be observed towards the Indians. Their lands and property shall never be taken from them without their consent. <laughs> and in their property rights and liberty, they never shall be invaded or disturbed. I don't think that happened. Um, unless in just and lawful wars, authorized by Congress. But laws founded in justice and humanity shall from time to time be made for preventing wrongs being done to them and for preserving peace and friendship with them. Um, <clears throat> During 1790, under the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution of the United States granted Congress the sole right to regulate commerce with the Indian tribes. A series of trade and intercourse acts from 1790 to 1834 established boundaries of Indian land and prohibited non-Indians, including states, from taking settling on Indian lands through purchase or treaty otherwise without federal approval. And so Indian agents were appointed by the federal government to act as liaisons between, between all of this. <clears throat> so the Congress authorized treaties to be conducted and Former Lewis and Clark Law Scholar Robert Miller, who has wonderful books out, you should check it out, and now is at University, um, Arizona State University. He defines treaties as thus. Treaty is a contract or compact between nations. It is an agreement that is binding upon the nations that sign the treaty. The United States Constitution says treaties are the supreme law of the land. The property rights that a specific treaty protects are not for all Indians in general, but are rights specific to the tribe that signed the treaty. The United States entered into more than 400 treaties with Indian tribes between 1778 and 1871. So the treaty process in the Northwest <clears throat> includes rights retained by the tribes to hunt and gather and f foods, and which, this is an important thing, usual and accustomed places. Usually people say UNA, UNA places. For tribes in the Pacific Northwest, a major decision occurred in 1974 when U.S. versus Washington, Judge Bolt mandates that a fair share was 50% of the harvestable fish destined to pass the tribe's usual and accustomed places and reaffirms tribal management powers. And prior to this decision, So Happy versus Smith, which 
14 Yakima tribal members challenged the legality of Oregon regulation of off-reservation fishing. The U.S., Yakima, Warm Springs, Umatilla, and Nez Perce tribes also sued these fishing rights. The federal court combined these two cases, and Judge Baloney ruled that the four tri treaty tribes were entitled to a fair share of the fish runs, and the state was limited in power to regulate. The state conservation regulations could not discriminate against tribes using the least restrictive means. Now, Judge Baloney and Judge Bolt were not uh, liberal judges in that sense, but they saw this law, that the law had to be applied and had to be adhered to ba based on the treaty rights. So, and the other thing that's really important about the treaty rights is the water rights, that the tribes have priority water rights that have an immemorial priority date. Think about that, immemorial. That's tens of thousands of years before written history. So today, we come today, we still have negotiations conducted with counties, states, and federal administrators who come and go and often do not understand the contract between the U.S. and tribes. Who are their neighbors? The loss of habitat and pollution are spreading beyond the natural diet to all who eat within the food shed. Tribal peoples are the first to call the alarm and have the right tools and understand the management of the resources for the protection of the health, prosperity, and our future for all. And this is evident in the co-management agreements that you'll look beyond short-term planning and look forward to at least 500 years. And I'd like to add here that some of the fisheries that we, some of the fisheries actually have plans that go 200 years in, in the future. I like to remind people that at Blue Lake up here, they had uh, sockeye salmon come in for the first time, they weren't landlocked because there was passage for them to the ocean. The Warm Springs Confederated tribes went into a great deal of debt to pin, put in a, a fish passage on the dams that we are part owners of so they could get past as well as have the right what river temperature. I like to say, <laughs> yeah, thank you. And as a longtime resident of Central Oregon, you know that Deschutes was considered the best trout fishing river in the world. And uh, my first fish I caught was like an eight pound steelhead and I was hooked for life. <laughs> I stopped at the local store and had the butcher measure it for me and he did so because who's gonna deny an eight year old girl the right to measure their fish? <laughs> and we have mountain goats in Mount Jefferson. We have bighorn sheep in the Columbia River Gorge and on our mutton mountains, which is why we're short, bighorn sheep were originally. We have the return of the condor coming soon from the York tribe. The eagle had been taken off the endangered species list. Uh, buffalo have returned. I think the animal that I'd like to see come back, and I don't know why people don't like them, are jackrabbits. If you've ever seen jackrabbits, they're kind of kooky and crazy. And then the full moon, they dance. <laughs> so there's a big movement out there right now, not only with the work that's being done through the land trust here and Deschutes Land Trust and everything else that's going on out there in the world, but there's a movement in the Americas, definitely. And there are two quotes I'd like to read you. One is from Don Morris, who is from the Working Group on Indigenous Food Sovereignty. Our relationships to the earth extends out to the forest, fields, and waterways. It is much broader than the arbitrary political boundaries of the nation state of Canada that fragments the social and ecological integrity of indigenous hunting, fishing, and gathering corridors. We need adaptive policies that challenge the system to work in more complexity. More than focusing solely on agriculture's sustainability, she suggests policymakers consider the nuances, nuanced relationships of those who've lived on and related to the land for thousands of years. So their working group includes not only Canada, but it goes down to New Zealand, Brazil, Ecuador, Mexico. And she says, we are the oldest living memories of what it means to live with one another and the land, water, plants, and animals, and work within the natural systems. And I end with this quote, because people seem to get 
a little uptight about treaty rights, but I think this says a lot about it. Uh, this comes from the Native Governance Center. A lot of people don't know history, treaty history, or chooses to ignore it. So when an indigenous people try to exercise treaty rights, say to hunt, fish, and gather on or off reservation, they get strong pushback from some non-indigenous people who see Indians as somehow getting special treatment. Put another way, some people erroneously view treaty rights as a gift from the US to indigenous nations. They are not. They represent an agreement negotiated between two sovereigns with rights and obligations applying to both sides. Non-indigenous people forget that their ability to have their homes on indigenous lands rests on treaty rights. When non-indigenous people want to rip up a treaty and say end, and say end special fishing rights, they're effectively tearing up their land deed. <clears throat> so I've kind of lived a life where I've been involved with, with you know, policy, I've been involved in art, I've founded different organizations, and, and I've had a pretty good run at it, and I really appreciate being able to come to you today and talk a little bit about what I've learned. So for me, I am Warm Springs and Wasco and, and uh, Navajo. And I want to say that traditional unity and the humble dignity and purity and intention, wholeness, is what we find in this kind of living, in this kind of being. I think we restore life with our attention and devotion. When you pay attention to the roots, they grow, meaning you have to disrupt them at certain times and put them back in the ground at certain times. So when the women go out and gather these roots, they're going out there with love in their heart and devotion. When the men go out and fish and hunt, they're doing the same thing. And I want you to think of us as each one who bears the echoing water within. We each bear the earth's renewal as a personal responsibility. We become one with the obdurate earth. So just to give you an idea of the two landscapes, geographies, we're all part of the uh, high desert mountain west. Um, I'm standing here below She Who Watches, which is a petroglyph in the Columbia River. Up here is Spider Rock, which is in the Canyon de Chez. This is my father, this is my mother, and these are the two books I wrote of poetry. And interesting, Spider Rock was a place where the deity Spider Woman is symbolized or rested at, and she scratched the four original clans from her shoulders. And there's this epic story about what happened in the formation of this land before people came. And so she is kind of, in effect, my grandmother, and my dad has building rights at the Spider Rock. She who watches, I didn't really understand until my Aunt Lillian began to do research and talk to different people, and she and I both have loved this image for a long time. And when she talked to the elders in Yakima and Warm Springs, they said, well, that's where your, 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 grand, your grandmother, her, my Aunt Lillian's grandmother's grandmother lived in that village below She Who Watches, next Louis Dix. I'm sure I'm not saying that right, but <laughs> A long time ago, there was things that were happening that were difficult for people, and there were um, it was said that there was these witches who were causing a lot of calamity up and down the river. And the coyote came down the river, and he was they to, he, somebody told him he came down the river, and was cleaning up the place. And when he got to where she who watches was, she he said, "Do you have a chief here?" And they said, "Yes, she's up. She lives up there in the rocks." And he asked them, do you live well? Do you, are you prosperous? And they said, yes, we're, we do well. We learned how to build houses. And so he went up to the rock and told her that the world was changing. There's going to be new people coming and women will no longer be chiefs. And he said, what would you, and she, he said, what do you want me to do for you? And she said, I want to stay and watch over my people forever. So he cast her into that rock. And because the pigment is now bonded with the rock, you can't date this. And as an example of how people have kind of co-opted the image, now Yakima Nation is very protective over it now. But there was a gentleman I sat next to at the uh, Oregon Historical Society's author party who was into petroglyphs, and he told me that she was a death mask. And I said, really, why do you say that? He goes, can't you see her grimace? 
that's he, the things on the side were her teeth. She's going like this. And I thought, and her eyes are piercing, you know, kind of like, a, I don't know, late night TV, the black and white thing. And I thought, well, I don't agree with you on that. And he did not talk to me much after that. <laughs> so going back to the, uh, the system or the code, water to starts and ends our meals. So we start and end each day with a sip. And beside the great river, the food chiefs are recognized in order from the river to the mountains. So the salmon are at the river, deer are kind of in between, and those are tended to by the man's side. And as you can see here, a kind of rough calendar of what happens when these um, fishes are, cap are caught. And right now, um, Tomaslik Cultural Institute is hoping, or they're working to refine this calendar because in reality, Indian calendars go 13 months and not 12 months. So these are our little relatives. So roots, neat, and berries, the foods and water, our religious sacrament, and this is, represents kind of the woman's side of caretaking of our little relatives. Here is the, the dinner, dinner um, you know, they bring it out and order to the table. And Eric Clamps at Umatilla always says the easiest way to remember the system is setting the table. You know, the deer, the roots, the berries, and so forth. And you can see here some of the instruments or the, uh, not the art pieces that are created to collect them. And you see here a gubbin that this lady uses to, to disrupt the soil and lift them out. And it's not destructive, they just don't go out and yank them out and, you know, that type of thing. So, wisdom's, the creator's wisdom is passed from generation to generation in worship, song, and dance. So, Kelly, Kelly Himsa here, <clears throat> who must be a young woman by now, <clears throat> shows um, her reverence, I think. She's wearing this basket hat that signifies that she's a root digger. Um, she's, of course, wearing her moccasins because we have to have the connection to the earth. And in the Salilo Longhouse, on the floor where people dance is earth. They, don't, they didn't put a wood floor on it. And that's Charlie, her dog, who would go fetch rocks. So the daily dialogue of our past lives, I think, and people who embody this with their dress and with the way they they uh, hold themselves, I think evokes images of the land's history and our inheritance of experiences. So the, these are simple precepts and I'm gonna share with you today. You can see warm springs here. This whole basin was the Columbia River Basin to the middle Columbia River. Um, Idaho is included in that, Montana, British Columbia, Washington and Oregon. So as long as nature is taken care of, it will take care of you. Traditional wisdom is systems thinking, do no harm. Take only what you need, let the rest grow. To understand a land's resources, respect it enough to know your own life is at risk with its loss. So being in it and being able to see patterns as inner relationships and responsibly responsibly adapt. That's also the important thing. So indigenous knowledge has been talked about a lot, traditional ecological knowledge, subsistence economy, all of these different cues for it. But um, one of the important aspects of this indigenous knowledge is the languages that are being lost at a her terrible rate. Um, they're land-based languages. Uh, they are built up through millennial investigation and productivity. And I think that the increasing appreciation and values of indigenous people and cultural values of indigenous peoples also respect biodiversity and cultural diversity. And this is decreasing worldwide through the loss of languages. This is the condor and the whale. <coughs> and the condor is actually the thunderbird. And they called the thunderbird, the whale, oh, excuse me. They called the whale the Thunderbird Salmon. <laughs> I think that's a cool picture. 
<clears throat> probably the most iconic and historic loss has been the Salila Falls. It was inundated in 1957. And here you can see the scaffolds that are on the river, the women who are preparing the salmon for in drying the salmon, baking the salmon. And <clears throat> it was thought that the um, when they were building the dams that they had dynamited Salila Falls. And they had dynamited a lot of really significant, significant places in the Columbia River in order to eliminate the, our attachment, the indigenous people's attachment to it. But a general actually had a sonar done and the Salila Falls is still intact. If the dam is removed, it will still be there. It might take a lot of time for the silt and mud and poisons to get washed away, but it's still there. And in, this is inside the longhouse. I'm going to talk a little bit about relationships. And that's what you build here when you come to this event. That's what you build when you become part of a land trust. It's what you do when you go out and you educate. You're building these relationships. Uh, when I first started teaching at the Institute of American Indian Arts, one of the things I told my student is that you're going to carry my words with you for the rest of your life. And I'm taking my responsibility seriously. And I'm not here to teach you how to write. I'm here to teach you how to think. So these are my relationships, my AIO family, which is Americans for Indian Opportunity. Of course, the longhouse here with the Salilo. I love that floor, it's, it's dirt. And of course, the writers who are people I think are under-respected or underutilized. So we have also people, I think, that contribute to our indigenous well-being and knowledge is our, our well-being and acknowledge the traditional systems. So here we have Willamette University. This lady here is one of the 13 original grandmas had met the Dalai Lama. Um, her name, and she's an ancestor now, is Agnes Pilgrim. And they were on a roll to get the, the Pope to rescind the Papal Bull of 1490-something where it was allowed for you to conquer lands, for, for Europeans to come and conquer lands and claim them for, <clears throat> for their, gut, for their um, country if the people there weren't Christian. And so they had an appointment and they showed up and I think the Pope at that time slipped out the back door. And so they, they lit up their stage and they were praying in the court, courtyard and the security guard came and stopped them and said, that was not allowed here. You can't pray in a foreign religion here. And one of the cardinals saw them and came out and asked them what they were doing. And they, they, they told him, and he says, why don't you come in and have lemonade with me? And they went in and had lemonade with him. And I never got to ask Eggy, but is he the Pope now? And the Pope now is doing a lot of stuff that, that's recognizing this, this important thing of colonization. Also evidence of an ancient um, knowledge are these petroglyphs. Um, a lot of the libraries in the Americas were destroyed by the Spaniards in, in Central America, but I was told by a Nahuatl elder there that their greatest book was not destroyed. It was the stone tablet that contained the Aztec calendar, that that was a book. And it changed the whole way I thought about, it changed the way I approached these petroglyphs. This is Speedus Owl. I think, I'm trying to find it here, but there's also another one called the water devil. But these are kind of warnings to people that this is a really rough patch of the river to be careful. And these here were removed uh, from site when they were exploding land for the Dallas Dam, or yeah, the Dallas Dam. And they were leaning up against the, the dam there. And my Aunt Lillian and I think Fred Ike and Louis Pitt spent a lot of time working with the generals to get them put back to the land and not leaning up against the building where pigeons were pooping on them. Again, Salilo Village, this is the new long house. These are the people and modern activities and older activities. There's going to be a uh, canoe journey. You can look that up online and find out more about it at Salilo, and I'm not exactly sure of the year, but 
Jefferson Green out there in, in the entryway can tell you, but in 2024 or 25, there will be hundreds of these canoes coming up the river. Of course, technology again, these baskets here, there's the deer and this is condor. These here are measuring implements for fishing and weights. Now, <clears throat> it looks fairly primitive, but they, they did a job. These bags we stored our food in and, and, and caches. During the trading system, trading times, people would trade entire baskets filled with roots in them. Some more of these baskets, and here's contemporary baskets. This is a tire track. And this is a story, a myth in this glass basket. But uh, my friend did, uh, he liked my tire track, so he put it on his basket. <laughs> so the condor, I want to be able to bring attention to the condor because <coughs> they're very uh, representative of how the health of the land is. Lead bullets and ammunition are killing them and are killing a lot of animals. But the Yurok tribe has begun to rebuild their populations and are letting them loose. They're in Arizona, and they're in, we also have an Oregon breeding facility at the zoo. And one of my friends really is dedicated to this condor, bringing back the condor. And we thought it was funny because they're really smart birds and they remember you like ravens do as well, and eagles. But, they, but there was a man who hated them and he didn't want them around his place. And he tried to get the condor people to act, kind of like remove them or scare them from his property. And what ended up happening was the condor started flocking to his place and sitting on his roof. <laughs> <laughs> they told him, he said, they know you don't like, like them. <laughs> and I don't know what happened after that. But another concept is with Shanaksha, carry it forward, generosity, the act of giving. And I think that these are examples of our international indigenous um, consciousness. The Pacific Rim is called the Rim of Fire from, you know, Baja, California all around to New Zealand and is volcanic lands. And the Hawaiian people traverse the oceans to come to the Americas. Of course, people have been coming to the Americas for a long, long time on both sides. But here is um, a meeting with New Zealand people and our Oregon tribes and right here, they made our Indian guys get up and try to learn the haka. <laughs> and it was hilarious. <laughs> and it's very intense. When I was in that marae, there was this young woman artist sitting there and this Maori man was standing nearby. And she looked up at him and he's getting ready, all prepared for the haka. And she said, stand closer to me. I want to feel your warmth. <laughs> I said, whoa. <laughs> So just, these are personal things that I've worked on in my life. So all these objects were made from the earth, did not disrupt its systems. They embody the belief that the earth provides for us and through the earth we prosper and absorb into our lives, ourselves, the potency of life. And of course, this is a lithograph I made in a Philadelphia workshop. Some of the baskets I've made, I learned from a traditional basket maker. And these are houses for our little sisters, the roots. And I did not know that until I learned weaving. And I had to weave airtight because she said, you know, eventually they'll loosen up. And I also had to weave in the hardest material possible, which is fine linen. I, was, I felt like she tormented me. <laughs> and I have to pay homage to my grandparents who also carried forth this knowledge. My uh, grandmother, Annie Begay, who wove that rug behind her. My grandfather, Chi Woody, who was an, a medicine man and knew all these songs. And my grandmother, Elizabeth Thompson Pitt, and my grandfather, Louis Pitt Sr. Um, they taught me all of this just through living and respect. So it doesn't have to come from a book. And of course, I love these pictures of my great grandma and my grandma and the things that they made. So this, this has a story to it that I think is important and I wanted to share with you. And it has to do with um, our burial mounds. And it was in the 70s, I think, when I was standing in the kitchen doing dishes and I had a black and white TV. And they said, oh, it's Delilah Falls. And I turned around and there was this image 
of skulls and skulls and crossbones all piled up. And they said, these are the, these are the rema uh, skeletal remains that were removed from Memelus Island and shipped to University of Washington, St. Petersburg University, uh, Berkeley, California, and the Smithsonian Institute. And it was like I was punched in the gut. And so my friend Joe and I made this poster, and it was under the Reflex portfolio. And we had them, we mailed all of these to all of the federal agencies in our region with the instruction to post it into their workroom. And I gave a copy to my younger cousin, Pita, who was very young at the time. And I was explaining to him these images, and he turned to his dad and he says, Dad, where are our human remains? Where are our ancestors? When will we get them back? And I think he was like nine or eight years old. And he says, I don't know, son. I'll have to find out. But they were brought back, the ones that were the Smithsonian and laid in Memelus Cemetery. And we've had remains returned from New Zealand recently. And it's been very emotional for us because we don't have ceremonies to repatriate people who have been dug up. But I want you to just kind of read this poem to you. First of the voices are innocent from memory. Desolate synthesis of weeping, rain into dry creek beds. Stone with roots, companion of gardens, guardians bears itself toward the summit of crowns. The exchange of bones for sawdust, for silt, for worthless currency. The clouding springs hiss into veins of fissures. Topsoil wears into desert an illusion of prosperity. The hiatus is the flourish of sword and degeneration. The river elegantly marked swirls on its surface, a spiral that tells of a place that remains undisturbed. And in many cultures, the spiral is the path to the perfect place or the path to harmony. So, and essentially you see these swirls on the river that made me think of that. And the other thing is, <clears throat> We have um, a lot to, to, to say to each other, and we're put into this silence. We're being told, you know, don't speak up, don't say anything. But if you really do have that heart for this land and this country, you do have to speak up. You do have to go out, and you do have to be there on the land to listen. <sighs> I don't think I'll read this one, but this is another lithograph I did, and of course, this is Coyote, he was always trying to get close to the Indian women. So here he is posing as a stole. <laughs> so thank you for your attention and time. And I will conclude with somebody that you might recognize, David Suzuki. The way we see the world shapes the way we treat it. If a mountain is a deity, not a pile of ore. If a river is one of the veins of the land, not potential irrigation water. If a forest is a sacred grove, not timber. If other species are biological kin, not resources. Or if the planet is our mother, not an opportunity. Then we will treat each other with greater respect. Thus is the challenge to look at the world from a different perspective. Thank you. <laughs> so we have 10 minutes. If you have any questions, you can ask them, and I'll try to repeat them for everybody. Oh, I should have put some, what do they call them, shills? <laughs> yeah? This is a very personal story, so don't take it as um, fact, because this is from my personal memory. I had um, an uncle who was one of the leaders of the tribe. Of course, I have a lot of uncles and a lot of aunts who are leaders in the tribe. But there was a big study being done to have a geothermal power plant on Mount Jefferson. And in our stories, the mountains were once people, and, and they're in their lodges now, and you're not supposed to disturb them. So 
they did all this big study and they're going forward to do the plans. And some of the ladies, elder ladies that went forward and said, we can't build a geothermal power plant up there. We, don't, we can't disturb the, the bean in that mountain. That's our law. And he said, so we had to stop after we spent all that money. And he says, you know, who's gonna, how are we going to pay for the education of our children? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? And he was distraught over it. But also, I think that showed the power of our natural law. And one of the stories, like, for example, of Black Butte here is that the Mount Hood and uh, Mount Adams are fighting at one point. I don't know their names in Indian. But they were having a horrible fight, and it just wasn't ending. And the other mountains were upset because they were throwing a lot of rocks across the river. They were just, you know, it was just a mess. And so they asked Shasta to come up because she was a good mediator and, and help them settle their dispute. And so she knew, she knew that they were going to take a long time because they were so stubborn. So she packed a lot of stuff to take with her, and Mount Black Butte was her husband. So he had to carry it all. And they got this far, and he just said, I'm so tired, I can't go any further. And she said, fine, just stay here. And she went on and, of course, settled the dispute and came back, back to where she is now. And Black Butte is still here, and he's sweating. That's what, Mount, that's what Metolius River is from. Yeah, there's a big balance as to what we do for, for our development and for our economic gain. And I think that in the 50s and 60s, when the tribes did their 20-year plan and had worked with uh, Oregon State University, the first thing they had to do is reclaim the businesses that were settled on the land that weren't theirs and to build an economy. And I think uh, Bob Miller talks about this as well, that every dollar we spend outside of our community is money that it doesn't really return. So we need to figure out ways to spend our money in our economy, be a little bit more um, complete, meaning that we have services here that, that we don't have to bring from elsewhere. Well, <clears throat> you know the, okay, sorry. How do I feel about the wolves returning to the reservation? I'm, I, we probably don't know this, but we have wolves on the Warm Springs Reservation. And I think we've had wolves for a long time. Not, they just haven't been seen. Um, there's I, actually really important keystone species that we have eradicated out of our system, the sea otter being one, the wolf, the bear. Um, and I think the condor the eagle, because they're competitors for the agriculture that's kind of been brought here to supplant the system that was already here. Uh, we have, um, people have discovered where they've reintroduced wolves that there has been a change in the ecosystem, particularly around water, because they control the, um, is it right, the ungulates, the deer, um, whatnot, uh, from getting to the stream. The conflict is between um, those who want to want to raise cattle and want to have their own animals in the system and they fear the wolf coming in and taking their animals which represents loss to them, monetary loss. I think we're coming to the point where we have some critical flicker moments with our water quality. Um, we have no longer have beavers which did a tremendous job of managing water and purifying water. So the wolves are part of that kind of systemic management of, of the land. And I think that <clears throat> even the reintroduction, for example, that's happening of the buffalo into the Great Plains, they're actually re reintroducing them. That's really important for that ecosystem because of the way that their, their hooves are actually churn up the grass just so that it can grow thicker and the other plants can grow better. Now, how I feel about the wolves is they are wild like the Indian and the American mythos. There's many, many texts that say, get rid of the wolf and get rid of the Indian. And I think that kind of mentality is what's more harmful 
then I think causing the loss of animals in our system. And I think when you have, for example, the loss of the grizzly bear, that's really been damaging. And there's a, um, important roles that they play. And there's an intelligence embedded in those species that aren't human, of course, but they're important. I was thinking of a story of a friend of mine told me about this big lodge they built in, a, for, in the Quay watershed and where I used to work for Ecotrust, we went up there. But they had returned, they had bought the land and had returned it to the uh, Heltzik people and the Owekno people. And so they built this big lodge and they wanted to build it like their old big houses. <clears throat> but no one knew how to build it, so they hired a contractor to come in and do this building for them. So he studied all their lodges, looked at all the historical data. He decided what diameter tree to get. They could not find one tree of the diameters that they needed to build this big house because it had all been lost. It had been clear cut. Second, third, fourth, fifth generation of trees are in this place. And so, interestingly enough, a really horrible storm came and out of nowhere came this great big tree, the diameter and size that they needed to build this lodge, but what they figured was it had disrupted this underwater and had brought that, this lodge, that log that had been preserved all these hundreds of years, underwater onto their um, shore. So they built the lodge and they had their big celebration and there's grizzly bear there, there's wolves that eat salmon there, um, there's deer that swim back and forth between the islands and they had this big promise to the land. They said, we are here again to be your protector and to be your, your family. We are here to protect the grizzly bear. We're here to protect the wolf. We're here to protect the, the salmon that are in the river and so on. And uh, so they got done and this contractor was like cleaning up everything. I mean, he was like going around picking up stuff that people leave in the debris. And there's this long road that kind of goes up maybe a mile to this lodge that was on the hill where people stayed. So he's walking up there and he ran right smack into a grizzly bear mama and her three cubs. And she was like really upset and she stood up and he said, I started praying and saying, I have just said, I just pledged that I will protect you and that I will protect your cubs and I will protect this land. I have, I have gave my, my heart to this. And he's, and he's saying this to himself. And she got back down on her fours, she turned around and she said something to her, she you know, vocalized to her cubs. They went straight up this hill and went over and she turned and looked at him and then she went up over the hill. And he told that story to the people who gathered there. And I think that's the kind of relationship that maybe would be helpful for us. I don't know if I could talk to a wolf. <laughs> but I know I have been in presence of cougars and my cousin asked me, he said, what do you do when you run into a cougar? I said, you act like you're top of the food chain. <laughs> and that's, you know, we, we act like we're top of the food chain, but that, with that comes responsibility. And more and more, we, we're going to be with these animals because we had been lived with them in the past. That I think we can live with them again, but we have to figure that out. Well, thank you. Have a good evening. And I think um, these future talks look really, really interesting. And I hope that what I shared with you tonight will give you food for thought. Um, one thing about the good thing about diversity and mutual respect is that we have that ability to hold our own. We are each given our own unique gifts and our own way of thinking. And we have to begin to, to, to do that. I mean, I used to be part of the hive mind. I mean, I was a punk rocker at one point. <laughs> but, but I also grew up, so. <laughs> okay, drive safe. <laughs>